Hello everybody, my name is Raccoon Bro, and welcome back to another reaction video. Now, I need to come clean. I know I've gotten a lot of requests to react to Skate Frillis's Every DreamWorks Movie Ranked video, but I had already seen it once the requests came pouring in. I didn't think you guys uh, were interested in seeing me react to something that was an hour long and not, you know, Snapcube. But uh, I, was I, I was surprised by the amount of people that wanted to see me react to it, so I apologize that I can't do that reaction video. But hopefully, with this Pixar movie video, I'll be able to uh, make up for it in a way. So, uh, consider this as a consolation to those who wanted to see me react to the DreamWorks one, but... Uh, I am, I am looking forward to this one because, uh, for those who don't know, I am currently in a Disney podcast with some online friends of mine, and we're doing the, uh, pick, we're doing a Pixar tournament right now in the style of March Madness, and we're calling it Pixar Panic, and I'm very curious to see how the rankings for this video line up with the rankings for our tournament, since we essentially left it up to the people to decide and we're deciding it all by popular vote, just like we did with uh, Disney movies for Mouse Madness. And we already know who the winner is for our version of the Pixar rankings. So how about we get into the mayhem and see how closely our rankings coincide with our resident shiny man, Skate Frillis. Well, you know what they say. Whenever someone makes a DreamWorks movie ranking, a Pixar ranking is sure to follow. Actually, no one has I don't think anyone said says that, that until now. But oh well, I'm ranking the Pixar movies. I have very conflicting feelings on Pixar as a whole. Generally, their output is better than most animation studios, but this unfortunately makes their slip-ups all the more egregious compared to a studio like DreamWorks, which is known for having a mixed output of quality. Plus, it's a little more upsetting in Pixar's case because you can pinpoint the exact moment in their history where they lost their edge and yeah. started delivering more mediocre products than good ones. Kind of like a long-running show like The Simpsons or Spongebob. But that it's doesn't mean they're out of the game entirely. Pixar is still fully capable of delivering masterpieces that'll stand the test of time, just like they did in the old days. I can be pretty mean to this studio from time to time, but that's because I love it and I want to see it do we're great only, things. We're only mean because we care. Who wouldn't? Now it's finally time to look at every feature film from this studio, the good and the opposite of good, and see <laughs> how I'd rank them all. Let's jump right into it. Disappointment in the game of life. Oh boy. I mean, I, I mean, what the f do you want me to say? This is one of the worst sequels. What did you of expect? Time and one of the worst animated movies I've ever had the displeasure of sitting through. It's awful by Illumination standards. There's enough to talk about here to fill up three whole cinematic disaster reviews. But oh honestly, boy. What is the Point. You know exactly what's wrong with this film. If you accept the insane premise that destroys every good aspect the original film had going for it, you're stuck with the most frustratingly stupid story Pixar has ever concocted. It is astounding how bad at their jobs these spy cars are. Hmm. Imagine a bug's life, but Flick doesn't realize he hired circus bugs even after they tell him they're from the circus multiple times, and you basically have cars it's too. So Everyone stupid. in this movie is a complete idiot. To to the point where it's not an exaggeration to call Mater the smartest character. As you can imagine, this makes for a completely intolerable viewing experience. Like, by intolerable, I mean this movie is worse than Turbo and Shrek the Third. Yes, Pixar has made something that worse is than the worst. Really Pixar bad. Movie. It's like they were actively trying to make a bad movie with this one. Like, there's two other Pixar cinematic wow. movies that I'll talk about very shortly. But with those movies, they had incredible troubled production histories that caused them to turn out so shitty. They were <laughs> failed but earnest attempts to make a good movie. But this? No, no, no. I refuse to believe that there was yeah. ever any intention of making this it movie. Yeah, it doesn't even come it's off impossible. as earnest. I would legitimately rather rewatch Minions than this pile of shit. That's a movie that clearly had less effort put into it, yet it manages to be more mature, more entertaining, and less infuriating than this Pixar movie. I am not jesting. 
Cars 2 is a movie for infants and absolutely no one else. Do I not sound angry enough? Well, that's because I straight up don't care. I don't give a shit about Cars, and while this movie permanently dented Pixar's morale and sent them on a decade-long losing streak, it's not like it ruined a franchise I was emotionally invested in. This is a terrible oh, idea well. for a bad franchise, and this movie is the exact legacy that John Lasseter deserves. John. It's a tie. Oh, it's a tie. And gentlemen, for the first time in Shafrilis ranking history, we have a we tie. two-way tie. What? Brave and the Good Dinosaur are pretty much equally awful. I like the idea that uh, Lightning comes out, and instead of hearing it's a three-way tie, he hears that it's a two-way tie. So he's like. Oh no! <laughs> and I cannot for the life of me determine which one is less awful. <laughs> they both have advantages and disadvantages that even each other out. For example, Brave has a story. You know, that's something you can't really say about Does Good have dinosaur. a story. But on the other hand, Good Dinosaur doesn't have a completely unlikable, obnoxious twat for a main protagonist. But that's not saying much! <laughs> Seriously, I cannot stress enough how equally I dislike these two movies. I guess the most efficient way to break the tie is to ask whether I would rather be absolutely infuriated or bored out of my mind to no end. Hmm. Which, um... Let's talk about these movies first. Both of them were the products of troubled productions, but Brave had far more insidious behind the scenes issues than Good Dinosaur. There's this excellent video by E Licorice. I think sure. I promoted a while back. It details everything that's wrong with this movie in excruciating detail, as well as its troubled development history. They fired the original director, Brenda Chapman, who, what? by the way, directed this one movie. You may have heard of it. It's called The Prince of Egypt. Oh yeah, my gosh! They fired her, their first and currently only female director, because she wasn't falling in line with known degenerate John Lasseter. No! They fired her and replaced Are her with this other guy who had no idea what the point of the story was. Gender has nothing to do with this movie. What the f*** are you talking about? There are plenty of stories where the main character's gender doesn't matter, but a story about a princess who's worried about getting married <sighs> and losing her independence in a medieval kingdom is absolutely a gendered story, you dipshit. How oh, is that Whatever. not a gendered story? Flows. Everything I said in my best animated feature ranking video still holds up. Merida is still the worst Disney princess and Pixar protagonist. <laughs> the bear twist is still the dumbest shit imaginable. There's no intrigue. There's no good humor. There's Ew. no compelling storytelling. It's as bad as I remember. The whole time I rewatched this movie, I just wished I was watching How to Train Your Dragon instead. In fact, yeah, I'll probably just do that the next time I do a Pixar marathon. And I should also replace Cars 2 with something better as well. Hmm. A movie that's better than Cars 2. Well, Rise of Skywalker it is. Oh, no! And now for The Good Dinosaur, the final installment I of still the haven't Pixar seen that movie, by the way. Than Ralph Breaks the Internet trilogy. <laughs> Like nice. I said, it's not inherently infuriating. Arlo is a bland, dopey, but not awful protagonist. I think he's awful. His dog boy Spot is a less interesting version of Boo, but he's not awful either. They are perfectly serviceable protagonists that just happen to be stuck in a tech demo. I don't like them, just so you guys because know. Because that's all this movie is. A tech demo for amazing landscapes. There's no plot. What little plot there is has been directly copy-pasted from other, better animated movies. Lion King? Arlo's dad dies because Lion <laughs> King. But it's not like he died because of a malicious plot. No, it's because he went out hunting with his son in the middle of a f***ing biblical storm. And he got Get swept up by a water slide. Oops! Something that doesn't even kill Arlo later on in the movie. What? So really, this is the dumbest thing it's ever. It's so dumb! He out loud when he died. It has nothing to Stop. do with it since Arlo is separated from the rest of his family three minutes later. Look what the the story is would not change if you took out this supposedly big emotional moment, which is emblematic of this movie's god-awful writing and pacing. This moment only exists to give Arlo a reason to hate the dog boy, but then they get high together and all seems to be forgiven. Jeez. The rest of the movie is a boring series of vignettes with unmemorable characters and no structure whatsoever. I can watch a movie with a notoriously troubled production like Solo a Star Wars story, and not really tell that production was troubled since the movie at least feels cohesive. But Good Dinosaur just screams troubled production in your face over and over again. Over and over and over and over and over. Like, it's clearly intended for little kids because of how childish and terrible over and the over dinosaur and over. designs are. But then the sexy Sam Elliott T-Rex tells this horrifyingly violent story about how he got maimed by a crocodile. I bit one croc in half, tail whipped the other, and the last one, well... 
I drowned that croc in my own blood. What is up with that? What? There's so much gratuitous <laughs> violence in this baby movie, and you just have to ask, who were they making this for? Who is and this obviously, for? obviously, the worst thing about this movie is how thoroughly it wastes its premise on such a <laughs> nothing story. Humans and dinosaurs coexisting, and this is what you do? You make the- Yeah, we, talk we talked about that a lot when discussing Good Dinosaur during uh, the podcast. It if you make it- the whole humans and dinosaurs coexisting, and the whole, like, meteor plot, it just- it has no bearing on the story. It could be cut out entirely. Human, a dog, and you give us no reasons for this story to be about dinosaurs? Gee, thanks! So yeah, it's a complete and utter mess with very little to enjoy, and I think after badmouthing it in so many videos now, I should probably give it its own cinematic disaster review. I have a lot more to say. But the question for now is... Which is worse, Not So Brave hmm. or The Bad Dinosaur? I mean, I guess I could judge them by which one had the better scene. I liked the first 10 minutes of Brave enough, and the cult leader pterodactyl eating a squirrel alive was funny. That's... But both of these movies have one great scene each in them. In Brave, we have that amazing moment where Merida defies her mother and shoots an arrow straight through another arrow. Badass. And in The Good Dinosaur, oh. there's actually this real- Yeah, I, I, I like that scene. Where Arlo and Dog Boy tell each other- That's a really good scene. Their ...families without any words. Just these little stick people. These these two scenes manage to capture the magic of Pixar for but a fleeting moment, which is more than that f***ing abomination Cars 2 could ever dream of doing. And if I had to pick the better moments... Probably the scene in Good Dinosaur. Thank there you. you. Go. That's my official ranking. Good Dinosaur is a smidge higher. I, 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 I might a change smidge. my mind next week, but that's where I'm at right now. Okay, bye! All right, you clockers! <laughs> to thank everyone in car town for helping me get all the things i needed cars sure is a movie yeah, it exists I don't like it. i'm sure you've heard all this before but cars is such a bizarre blip in quality for this studio that it defies all logic i mean this movie came out between the incredibles and ratatouille so it's mm. not a favorable comparison in either direction on my latest rewatch i clicked with a couple of scenes like when sally talks about how the town used to be and that sad song plays or the stuff with doc hudson's backstory Story. These are the moments where everything starts to come together, and you remember that this is, in fact, a Pixar, Pixar movie. movie. I genuinely forgot for the first hour or so, because this movie is not funny or charming or intelligent or engaging for like 75% of its runtime. The race scenes are cool, Lightning's character arc is moderately okay, and the ending is pretty wholesome, but for the most part, we're just toiling away in hillbilly hell with some frankly annoying characters. I don't like Mater. He has a good line once every 15 mm. attempts, and that's about it. The rest of this town doesn't fare much better. There's a ton of filler and annoying moments. The villain is literally just Randall again, but without the wit or threatening presence. I'm sorry, I take that back. I love you, Chick Hicks. You're the best. Good year, guys. Overall, Good year. I'm sure to get through this movie. That that I've disliked Thank since you. childhood and didn't ever want to see again. But honestly, I'm glad I did, because there's enough good stuff here to make it semi-worthwhile. Even though now I'm never watching it again. I swear. Onward, Shiva! Onward still kind of blows, not gonna hmm. lie. I reviewed it back when it came out, and not much has changed upon rewatch. The most aggravating thing about this movie is that it would have been significantly better if the Barley character was voiced by anyone. Literally anyone, anyone. other than Chris Pratt. Well, I guess that's not true. It could have been worse. It could have been voiced by James Corden. Let's <laughs> roll, my Felicia. Well, whatever. It's still God. One of the I, I hate that actor with such a burning passion. Oh my gosh! Don't even. I don't even want to hear his voice ever. I want. I never want to hear his voice ever again. My God. It's pretty bad how it is now. There's just this smugness to his voice, this obnoxiousness that makes him so unpleasant to watch and listen to. I like Tom Holland's performance and character enough, but they pair him with this smug-ass Star-Lord dino wrangler asshole, and I just can't get emotionally invested. I just can't. It should have been Jack Black and Michael Sarah. I'm just saying. It should have been Jack Black and Michael Sarah. I tried picturing this character with Jack Black's voice, and it was a million- <gasps> Thank you! Thank you, Skate Frillis! Thank you! Ten times better. Hey, how's it going? Obviously, the way Barley is written would also need to be tweaked, and maybe the idea that he's Ian's true father figure should have been built up more if the movie wanted that to be its focus. But overall, yeah, it's mainly the voice acting that kind of sinks this character for me. It doesn't feel genuine. I don't feel any emotions for these brothers or this stupid-ass van or even the dad legs. It's just too weird of a concept to get hmm. invested in. 
Speaking of concepts, the idea of a fantasy world that gradually forgot about magic and needs to rediscover it is cool, but they don't do anything interesting with it. Every character they come across that stopped adventuring or stopped using their wings or whatever just regains their magical attitudes or abilities accidentally, after like 5 minutes of interaction with the main characters. It's repetitive and lame. The movie has a handful of scenes that work, like the crust and the bridge scene, and the final battle and emotional resolution especially are really, really strong. I feel like it almost made up for the rest of the movie's mediocrity, and it's really the only reason that I have it ranked above Cars. <laughs> Lastly, while I'm glad a ton of people like this movie, I hated getting comments like, you all obviously never had a brother. If you did, you would actually like the movie. J shut up. I went to see this with my- That is so not cool. That is not a cool comment. My brother and we both didn't like it. Like, I relate to Ian enough. I'm introverted and had trouble inviting people to stuff. I had the biggest fear of merging onto the highway for the longest time. That's something I've never seen replicated in a movie before until this one, so that's cool. It does not mean I have to like the movie. Relating to a movie and seeing myself in it does not automatically make it good. Lady Bird is not one of my favorite movies just because it's immensely relatable to my life, but because it's got incredible writing, acting, pacing, and editing on top of that. If you love Onward because it's immensely relatable to your own life, that is awesome. Awesome. I'm so happy it exists for that reason alone. But I don't rate a movie's quality solely on relatability. And this is not the last time I will heavily relate to a Pixar movie despite not really liking it that much. With that said, let's keep going, shall we? The screen slater interrupts this program oh for an boy. important announcement. Well, if it isn't my old, painfully average friend. Hello. Honestly, my original review of this movie is pretty much right on the money, aside from my unfortunate slander of the score. The score slaps, and I'm sorry I said otherwise. <laughs> but for the most part, Thank you. this movie pisses me off. It's genuinely one of the most disappointing animated films ever made. That might sound melodramatic, but when you consider Brad Bird's track record in the realm of animation, and you consider how we waited 14 years for a follow-up to the original movie, it's hard not to feel a little ripped off by the final product here. Because that's what Incredibles 2 is. A product. Product. A product that lost an entire year of production because the higher-ups needed to push something out during summer 2018 <laughs> after Toy Story 4 got pushed back. And it shows. This is such a first draft of a script that it's kinda comical. Almost nothing involving Bob and the kids- By the way, that Clone High is- I'm glad he made a reference to Clone High. It's actually important to the overall story. It's just a collection of filler plot lines you would find in an Incredibles TV show. Most of it is decently charming and funny, but it feels like such a waste of time nonetheless. Dash's entire character is, I can't do my math homework and also I'm hyperactive and annoying and have nothing else going on. Violet is more entertaining here than in the original, but this plot line <laughs> where her date gets his memory erased is so lame. Why can't they go on a date and she tries to act normal and hide her superpowers, but then she secretly uses them in some way to make the date go better? I don't know, do something like what the tale of Zuko did. Do more interesting things with these characters. <laughs> Bob was honestly really unlikable in this movie. Like, he actively resents his wife's success and they never give him a moment where he apologizes apologizes to her or comes to terms with his disappointment at not doing hero work. They just drop this plotline entirely when we get to the final act, so they basically made him unlikable for no reason. Cool! Hmm. Jack-Jack is funny, especially when they pair him with Edna, but again, none of this ever becomes plot relevant. It's just more filler in a movie absolutely coded with it. The Elastigirl plotline has great action sequences, but they lead up to one of the lamest twist villains to ever come out of either Disney or Pixar. She's so predictable and her ideology isn't well fleshed out at all, leading to such an embarrassing and unmemorable antagonist. Her brother is also kind of lame too. I feel like they didn't go far enough with his eccentric personality. If he was more like Varric, that would have been neat and memorable, but ultimately he's just a forgettable red herring. The other superheroes suck. They have no personality and their designs blow. In fact, that's another thing about this movie. I honestly hate Ugh. the new character designs. They just don't look good in this animation style. Usually, Brad Bird has great, expressive character designs for his animated movies, but the NPCs in this movie just look awful. I forgot that that was a character design. That's... Oh, that's horrifying. God. Ew. Even old characters like Bob just look too wrinkled and super weird. Like, tone the detail back, guys. Good lord. Another aspect of the visual design they really needed to tone down was the 50s aesthetic. Like, it's cool. It looks amazing. But it clashes so hard with the aesthetic of the first film that it feels mm -hmm. off. 
I mean, this movie is supposed to take place immediately after the original, but you could honestly mistake the original for taking place in the modern day. Hmm. I know I did as a kid. This movie, by contrast, is so aggressively 50s that it doesn't even feel like it takes place in the same universe as the first film anymore. And also, why was Void set up as someone important only to not be important? I thought for sure they were building up to her getting freed by Violet on the boat, and then the two of them team up to free everyone else. That would have made for such a great, natural dynamic, and it would be a good payoff for establishing establishing Void as a character. But no, just give me my superhero lesbians already, Pixar. <laughs> what are you waiting for? What Look, are overall, you waiting for? This is a for? fine enough time with good humor and great action, but it's got one of the messiest stories out of any Pixar film and the characters just aren't the same. A ton of people got mad at me for not liking it that much when it first came out, but now, two years later, it's abundantly clear just how little of an impression this movie left on people. <laughs> After 14 years of begging Pixar to release it, it finally came out, and now no one talks about it. Oh well. And that's kinda sad. All of the monsters. monsters University is weird, because I feel like it's simultaneously underrated and not really that great at the yeah, same Yeah, me like, too. For a movie that has no reason to exist, it actually turned out pretty decent, and I don't mind its existence. Kind of like Solo A Star Wars Story. Wow, that's two Solo A Star Wars Story references in one video. What are the odds? This is the most I've thought about Solo all year. <laughs> but yeah, it's a nice enough prequel that develops Mike and Sully's relationship pretty well. I like how they don't get along and feel the need to one-up each other. Plus, I like how Randall starts out as Mike's friendly roommate. My relationships with former roommates and or friends have definitely soured in the past, and I have no trouble believing that Randall and Mike hate each other to the extent that they do in Monsters, Inc. I just wish this movie didn't forget Randall was a character, because his turn to the dark side is entirely off-screen, so that's bizarre and disappointing. Yeah. Anyway, now that I've actually been to college, I appreciated the vibe this movie was going for. I think the time was right for Pixar Make a college, college movie. movie, since the kids who grew up with the first Monsters, Inc we're probably at an age where this new movie was relevant to them. It hits a little harder with me for that reason alone. Another aspect of this film that doesn't get enough credit is the additions to the world building. This movie shows us that there's a science to scaring kids, that there's a bunch of different techniques to utilize in certain situations, and that every monster has some sort of unique attribute that makes them scary in their own way. It's really fascinating stuff. I also love the message this movie portrays. It really cuts deep and I relate to it immensely. I personally always wanted to perform in musicals, but hmm. I just didn't have the singing chops. I was never quite gonna be good enough, and that's okay, because I found purpose through other aspects of theater, such as writing and directing. Mike's journey in this movie is so similar to mine, and I found that really special. He wanted to be scary so badly, and he tried his hardest, but it didn't work out. And that's okay, because he found purpose in scaring through his impeccable coaching, helping Sully achieve maximum scariness and resulting in one hell of a brilliant, emotionally charged final act. I'm so happy this- That final act really is what makes the movie. This movie exists just for its message alone. It honestly really helped me out at a time in my life when I needed it. But the movie is still not great, I'm sorry oh, well. to say. For some reason, I relate to Dan Scanlon Pixar movies a lot, and yet still find them mediocre. I, I, I don't know why that is. It just is. But yeah, once we get to the whole Scare Games plot, I just completely lose interest. And that's a huge chunk of the film. So much stupid shit happens in this huge chunk. These unmemorable side characters get to be unmemorable. Mike kind of gets annoyingly arrogant for a while. This Dean appears to have no life outside of tormenting Mike and Sully. Like, oh my god, get over yourself. <laughs> <laughs> your scream can you should have put it in a glass case dipshit uh the professor appears to get some sort of weird boner for sully and honestly i just kind of don't buy the whole mike isn't scary shtick the movie's going for i'd be pretty scared if this one-eyed gremlin came into my cabin in the middle of the night and why is he the only member of this team that gets singled out the purple guy isn't scary he looks like a goofy ass muppet i would laugh out loud if he attempted to scare me but you don't see anyone calling him out for dragging the team down also, boo! The Abominable Snowman cameo sucks! Boo! Honestly, this is a worse retcon to me than the fourth grade line from the original film. Yeah. You could have had the snowman in the movie, just have him interact with literally any other characters besides Mike and Sully. Why was that hard? This movie totally could have been great and has some great underrated stuff in it, but a lot of that stuff does get buried in an avalanche of mediocrity. The first act is solid, the third act is great despite some problems. <laughs> the second act is is just a slog to get through. I'll rewatch it every few years or so, but I usually just rewatch the good stuff over and over. Yeah. It's okay. Moving on. You're old. You're old. 
Cars 3 is easily the best one. Amazing how Pixar managed to get something of quality out of this franchise. And it's not much of a contest. From John Lasseter's filthy, grimy paws. Now, don't get me wrong. Cars 3 is not that good. It's just decent. But decent is a miracle for a franchise so conceptually <laughs> broken. Speaking of conceptually Mad. broken, yes. Everyone referring to Lightning as an old man when he looks and sounds just as exactly young as he the did same. In the first movie is confusing as shit. I don't like it. Some scenes are still really dumb, like this weird-ass training montage. The villain is just Chick Hicks again, but boring. You can't compete with Kachiga. You just can't. But what makes this movie kind of sort of work is the fact that it ditches Radiation Stinks, the worst thing about the first movie, <laughs> and it ditches literally every everything thing that happened in Cars 2. That's hysterical, and it kind of goes to show how this is the real sequel to the original Cars. Cars 2 was basically just a feature-length Mater's Tall Tale spinoff that shouldn't have even bothered with including racing in its plot. But anyway, yeah, this- Cars 2 really would have been better if it was just a Tall Tales short, wouldn't it? This one's all about the racing, and legacy, and not throwing away your shot, and damn it, it's kind of effective. I think this movie's portrayal of imposter syndrome and finding a new purpose in something you love is done even more effectively than it was in Monsters University. I like this new yellow car that Lightning McQueen trains with, I like her sad backstory, and I like how she gets a chance to prove herself after thinking her opportunity had come and gone. I like Lightning coming to terms with his age and finding new purpose in training someone else, just like Doc did with him. I like the emphasis on Doc in general, and the legacy he left behind in this universe. And overall, this movie has a bit of that indie quality to it that I appreciate in the best Pixar movies. Not that this is anywhere near one of the best Pixar movies, but it's still not afraid Obviously. to take its time and focus on the characters and be a surprisingly mature conclusion to this let's be honest, duology of movies. Some yeah. of it is boring, and some of it is stupid, sure. I guess that's kind of inescapable when talking about cars. But for the most part, I had a decent time revisiting this, and I don't think I gave it enough credit initially. I'm kind of glad Pixar made this, and I might even rewatch it from time to time and just completely skip the first two, because I'm genuinely not missing anything by doing so. Are there other bugs in your life? No. A Bug Bug's Life, life <laughs> is my favorite forgettable movie. Pixar movie, of which there are many. I've said a lot of mean things about it in recent videos, but honestly, after rewatching it for the first time in ages, I've come to realize that perhaps I treated it too harshly. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, the stuff that sucks about this movie really sucks. It's so overindulgent with the whole liar plotline, and it makes no sense whatsoever. This whole misunderstanding where Flick hired them without realizing they were circus bugs is really dumb too, and it's a shame so much of the movie's plot hinges on this dumb shit. Honestly though, aside from that, this movie is just really charming. Like, surprisingly so. The environments are really impressive considering how early on in Pixar's life this movie was, the characters are mostly endearing and funny, the action sequences and climax are surprisingly amazing. Hopper is such a great villain who almost seems a little too great for this movie, honestly. Mm -hmm. He probably elevates the score a bit because of what a good threat he poses. Randy Newman's score is a huge improvement over his already good Toy Story score, and yeah, overall this was just a really fun movie to revisit. It's not as thematically rich or compelling as later Pixar movies, which is probably why it's grown overshadowed by the rest of their impressive catalog. But it's kind of like the Pixar equivalent of Over the Hedge. Just some nice, fun Funny, endearing. Wait, scene. I have to go like back. Pixar equivalent of over the. Is it? Who is that f Fox character? I, f I feel. Is there like a Cartoon Network show where it's like, it's about a skunk and he learns martial arts? I don't know. That's what it reminds me of. The hedge. I'm probably. I might nice, be wrong. Funny, endearing, simple comfort food to snack on in between the studio's rich cinematic meals. Over the hedge is still better though. You got <laughs> Stevie me. Is it four? Toy Story One is the weakest Toy Story. Oh. Game, but it's also the funniest one. Ah! It's a riot. I am jealous of this movie's comedic timing. But honestly, aside from the humor and the general imagination of this toy world they've created, this movie just isn't really one of my favorites. Dare I say, it's one of the most overrated Pixar movies in my opinion. Interesting. <gasps> did he just say, I, he did? Like, it's a solid enough foundation for this studio and it's a much better first movie than Ants, but it's got a few things holding it back for me from being actually great. It's probably not fair to say the animation, cause it's insanely impressive for the time, what with this being the first fully CG movie ever and all, so we'll move past that. What I don't really like about this movie is Woody. I get that he's supposed to have this character arc where he goes from being really mean to more understanding, but honestly, he's just such a dick for so long that it makes a lot of this movie kinda unpleasant to rewatch. 
He had plenty of jerkish moments in the sequels, but in those movies you could see where he was coming from and kinda understand his perspective. Cause those movies had much more nuanced conflicts than this one. In this one, he's just fueled by his jealousy and resentment, and while it's somewhat compelling to see him move past that, it's just not very fun. Speaking of not very fun, we spend so much time in Sid's dingy nightmare house and I kinda hate it here. <laughs> not only is it an unpleasant location with a really unpleasant, annoying antagonist, but it kinda drives the pacing to a halt. Aside from Buzz's identity crisis, there's not much going on here until Woody and Buzz have their emotional reconciliation. My last big problem with Toy Story 1 is that it just feels like it's saying the least out of all the Toy Story movies. It's really good at setting up Woody and Buzz's characters and developing their friendship, but it doesn't really do much outside of that. The sequels all have way more interesting themes, compelling side characters, and frankly better stories than this movie. It's a good enough introduction to this world that becomes the basis for some of the best sequels ever made, and it has its fair share of incredible moments, like the entire climax, but overall, it's not my go-to Toy Story movie, unless I'm in the mood for some phenomenal meme moments. Which I, I find interesting, because the first Toy Story made it all the way to the final four, and I don't think I voted for it a single time in any of its matchups. <laughs> I like how with the non-Toy Story Pixar sequels, there's no real consensus regarding which one is best. Some people like Cars 3 or Incredibles 2 best, some are loyal to Monsters University, and you know there's at least one sick, depraved individual out there who genuinely thinks Cars 2 is the best Pixar sequel. Please. Keep it to yourself. Stay away but from for me, me. Finding Dory is by far the best out of this fairly mediocre group. Like, you still have to make a ton of concessions with it, just like with any Pixar sequel, but I think the movie's strengths far exceed its weaknesses. About those weaknesses, though. Yes, it's real dumb that Dory gets these convenient memory flashbacks one after the other in order to move the plot along, and it makes the screenplay feel kinda repetitive at times. Marlin getting angry at Dory towards the beginning is kinda jarring and a bit of a regression for his character, even if it's just this one scene. Marlin and Nemo also also don't add much to the story, and the new characters, while fun, aren't nearly as memorable as the original movie's characters. Aside from all that though, this is just a legitimately fun romp through this aquarium. I really like Hank, and I think he has a great dynamic with Dory. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Speaking of that, Dory is just more entertaining to me in this film than she was in the original. Every aspect of her backstory you could possibly ask for is explained in logical and clever ways. Like, she speaks whale because her childhood friend was a whale shark. Ah. She can read because she grew up in this aquarium with all these words constantly surrounding her. That's neat. I also just love how encouraging this movie is for people with disabilities, and I think it's really clever how the movie introduces new characters who all have some sort of disability, but doesn't explicitly draw attention to any of them. Hank is missing an arm, Destiny has trouble seeing, Bailey lost his echolocation briefly, but none of these elements define who these characters are. Just like how Dory's disability doesn't define who she is or what she can accomplish. It's a beautiful message. It's really powerful to see her parents worry over her and whether she'll be alright, only to lose her for so many years. That first person perspective shot where Dory thinks her parents are dead is really great and anxiety inducing, but the pinnacle of this movie is this incredible yep. shot, where we see all the shells Dory's oh, yeah. parents laid out in the hopes that she'd follow them home. It's such a tremendously powerful image, and I love how it isn't immediately explained. The audience is allowed to connect these <laughs> dots for themselves and get hit in the feels. I don't know, man. This is just kind of everything I could ask for in a sequel to Finding Nemo. It's funny. It's emotional. It's just a really good time in spite of its flaws. It's one of the most overhated Pixar movies for sure. Like, Come on, guys. It's really fun. Also, the truck scene is complete and utter nonsense, but I kind of love it for that reason. Okay, moving on. Look, your friend. So the what? truck scene is complete and utter nonsense, but I kind of love it for that reason. The Verminator truck chase. Yeah, fair enough. Reason. Okay, moving on. Look, your friend is going to be in quarantine. That's where you <gasps> take the sick fish. Bruh. Balloonie started floating away. I tried to reach up? out and grab him, but... I still don't get the hype around Up, my friends. Oh, well. It's a movie that peaks in the first 15 minutes and only ever comes close to those same heights in scattered short moments here and there. Like, the scene where Russell talks about how he used to spend time with his dad and how the stuff they did may have been boring, but he remembers the boring stuff the most. And then that comes back when Carl flips through Ellie's adventure book and realizes that she felt the exact same 
same way. That's so smart and touching. I really wish the rest of the <laughs> why? movie was like this. Why is but Nick it's there? Just shenanigans with this kid and dog and bird, and nothing about it really feels all that cohesive or super engaging. It's just a fun adventure with decent characters and not much else. Hmm. Doug is really fun, but I still don't care for Russell or Kevin all that much. The villain is pretty good, but not pretty great. And again, that's just kind of this movie. It's pretty good. I have a good time whenever I watch it. But if you're going to open a movie with this, you better have a damn phenomenal rest of the movie in store. And this is just not that. I like it. It's charming. It's cute. It's fun. But it's not Best Picture nominee material. That's for sure. Now what? Finding Nemo is a good movie. That's really about it. I feel like out of all the Pixar movies, this is the one where my opinion on it has changed the least over time. I thought it was good as a kid, it remained good as a teen, and it's still good as an adult. I just think it's, it's got a good really movie. strong emotional beats and a lot of fantastic jokes. It's a good like, movie. Overall, it kind of feels like it's saying the least out of all the 2000s Pixar movies, cars excluded. It's charming in its simplicity, and it does have great messages for both parents and kids. But the story feels very episodic, and not all of these episodes really go towards furthering the movie's themes. Some are just cute, fun filler, but not much else. Dory's an okay character here, but she doesn't speak to me as much as she does to others, and I really don't care for the tank gang that much, but yeah, overall it's good. Mm. It has really high stakes and an immense sense of scale and wonder, which is ultimately- I like that the tank gang is at least all played by- they're all played by character actors. That's- that's what I really enjoy about them. ...what puts it above finding Dory ever so slightly. I'm happy to revisit it every now and again, and I totally understand why a ton of people rank this one as one of Pixar's all-time bests. It's just not quite up there for me. Alright, before we get to the top 10, the Pixar movies I actually consider to be great, let's take a moment to acknowledge that Finding Nemo had a net in it. You know what else has a net? The internet. And you know what's on the internet? Mm. Websites. Nope. And you know where you can build Nuh uh your business with the rest of the world head to squarespace.com for not happening and when you're ready to launch go to squarespace.com slash shapefurless to save 10 percent off your first purchase of a website or domain what the fuck did you do to the mindscape for some reason inside out <laughs> is the pixar movie that seems to have the most bad faith criticism attached to it like there's people who revel in the idea that this movie is bad because well actually joy is the villain of the movie because she's too controlling and restrictive of the other emotions and that's a bad thing well no shit that's of a course bad it's thing. a bad thing the entire point of the movie that's is that joy realized she was wrong by acting that way and by the end of the movie she lets the other emotions take charge when necessary She's a flawed individual who goes through a strong, tangible character. What is wrong with you people? That makes her a villain to you people. Wow, I guess Woody's the villain in Toy Story 1 then, right? He's an asshole who drives the conflict and knocks Buzz out the window, so I guess he's evil. Never mind the entire second half of the movie where he right? realizes he was wrong. Right? To befriend Buzz. Right? Nope. That doesn't happen. Marlin never grew out of his antagonistic, overprotective. God, family. it's Mr. such a incredible. Never learned to appreciate his family above his work. Lightning McQueen never befriended a single person. Not one. They are the villains of their story. I hate that criticism so much. Works. There's a lot of things you can critique with Inside Out, but if you genuinely think Joy being this malicious antagonist is a valid criticism, then these children's films are probably a little too advanced for you. <laughs> anyway, the reason Joy's character arc works for me more than Woody's in Toy Story 1 is because even though Joy is wrong to shun sadness and control the whole mindscape herself, she manages not to be an unpleasant character, at least for me. She's charming and fun, and it's clear that she means well. She genuinely thinks shunning all other emotions and trying to keep Riley happy 24-7 is the best thing for her. And it's really compelling to watch Joy realize that her way of thinking is fundamentally flawed. I especially love how the movie doesn't portray its message through dialogue that much. Mm -hmm. It opts to show us the value of sadness rather than outright explaining it. The climax is an absolutely stunning example of this. It's just an unbelievably amazing scene. I like how more of the Finding Nemo-esque vignettes found in this movie's journey are actually about furthering the movie's message about the value of sadness. And if they aren't about that, they're just wildly creative and fun, like that weird-ass trip to the second <laughs> Also, another thing this movie doesn't get enough credit for, it's hysterical. Like, I laughed way harder and more frequently at this than most of the other Pixar movies. The physical comedy, writing, and voice 
voice acting are all equally sharp, making for a riot of an experience. In spite of a few bizarre plot holes here and there, this movie is simply great. And when yeah. it first came out, it was more than great. It was the first Pixar movie in five years that was up to the same level of quality as their 2000s movies. After Cars 2 and Brave, I thought Pixar was dead, and Monsters University didn't exactly fix things, so thank god this movie came out when it did. Thank you. Four. Like how How to Train Your Dragon 3 would have made for a perfect series finale to DreamWorks as a studio, I personally think Toy Story 4 would make for an excellent series finale for Pixar. I mean, Toy Story 3 would be a better series finale, especially considering how rapidly things went downhill for Pixar right afterwards, but regardless, here we are in the future, hmm. and I'm filled with emotions over how surprisingly great and conclusive Toy Story 4 really is. It seemed like the dumbest idea ever, right? Why continue a franchise that ended on such a perfect note? Toy Story 4 is already pretty bold for even existing, but what makes it the boldest Pixar movie to date is the fact that it is, as my brother put it, the anti-Toy Story movie. It runs so counter to the themes of the first three movies, basically saying, you know all that stuff Woody learned about what it means to be a toy? Well, throw it in the garbage. None of that applies to him anymore. And the insane thing is that the seemingly scathing statement about Toy Story 4 is exactly what makes it such an amazing, worthwhile conclusion for for the franchise. All three had to do was stick the landing and carry out the natural progression of 2's narrative and themes. In both of these movies, Woody almost leaves his friends behind because he believes there's something more important than making a child happy. He could go to the museum and be preserved forever as a collectible that children admire from afar. He could go with Andy to college and live on as a keepsake, a memento of Andy's childhood. But he doesn't go through with either of these paths because as a toy, he values the love of a child above all else. This is what it's all about, to make a child happy. Except it's not. There's more to life for a toy than what they were made for. And by thrusting Woody into a position where he doesn't receive love from a child anymore, we get to watch him struggle to find meaning in his life, not as a plaything but as his own person. This movie is all about breaking down the idea that toys only have value if a child loves them. Aww. With Bo's help, Woody is able to find new purpose by becoming a lost toy and helping other toys find owners. He's dedicating his life to a noble cause instead of collecting dust in a museum shelf or a college dorm or in Bonnie's closet. This is what makes his farewell in this movie so impactful and necessary. His mission with Andy's complete and Bonnie will be okay without him. It's time for him to live his yeah. own life, and not the life his kids make up for him. The first three movies all open with fantasy sequences involving the toys, because that's what those movies were about. How important toys are as children's playthings. The fourth movie opens with a real-life toy rescue mission, because that's what this movie is about. How important toys are as their own people. Toy Story 4 is just thematically genius, on top of being hilarious, <laughs> yeah. exciting, powerful, and an all-around great time. Yeah, it has problems. Buzz's inner voice thing is ludicrous, but Pixar has honestly been kind of bad at writing him as a character for a while now. The pacing is a little slow sometimes, the getting the RV to the merry-go-round scene is flat out ridiculous, and a little more Forky would have been nice since he's fantastic. This movie is flawed for sure, and it's not quite as good as 2 or 3, but I love it nonetheless for taking a bold storytelling risk that paid off beautifully. I thought it was a good, solid 7 out of 10 when I reviewed it at Target way back when. But now it's a great 8 out of 10, y'all. I feel like it's another Pixar movie I should dedicate an entire video to, since it's easily the most overhated film in Pixar's entire library. But I love it, fam. It's a miraculously good conclusion to an amazing franchise. But for the love of God, don't make any more. There's nowhere left to go for real this time. Please stop here. Thank you. Good. For real this time. Stop. Please. No more. Stop. I, th I, I like it, too. I, ju I just think it's really funny. For your soul. <sighs> Upon rewatch, I think I found Soul to be slightly better than Inside Out, yet still slightly beneath Coco. It's just kind of a lot to take in for a Pixar Soul movie. Soul is so freaking good, man. Really I love that movie. Life lessons that'll hit adults way more than kids. It's a really smart and clever movie all about how you don't have to do great things to live a great life. It plays with the structure of a typical Pixar movie and goes to many unexpected places. Despite the overlap of ideas with movies like Inside Out and Coco, Soul is definitely its own distinct entity and it really sticks out amongst Pixar's catalog. 
I think Soul is the best directed Pixar movie. Not only does the Soul world have this tremendously intriguing and ethereal feel, but the movie portrays the simple pleasures of life and the emotions of the characters in really clever and nuanced ways. Like in the scene where Joe is telling his mom why he wants to live his life the way he does. His mom is bathed in this harsh yellow light throughout most of the scene, in contrast with Joe's blue light, the same color as people's souls. And when he finally confesses to her that he's afraid his death would have meant that he amounted to nothing, She's touched by this and she walks into the blue light, showing Ooh. that she finally understands what's at the core of his soul. I adore the way the lighting tells the story here. It's so good. Soul is sometimes a bit clunky in the script department, but for the most part, it's a genuine triumph. Definitely one of the best Pixar films in recent years and well worth checking out if you haven't already. Oh, here, Coco. <laughs> I thought for damn sure I was gonna make it through this Pixar marathon without crying once. I cleared the opening of Finding Nemo, the opening of Up, the end of Toy Story 3, the end of Inside Out. Literally nothing was gonna make me cry. Hey, here comes Coco. Oh, God damn it. Yeah, no, this movie's <laughs> impossible to clear without crying. J just can't be done. So, I don't think it's I controversial agree. to say that Coco is the best Pixar movie to come out during the 2010s. And it's still only an 8 out of 10 for me. It's Aww. the best one, and it's an 8 out of 10. That's just a little bit sad. Aww, yeah, this man. Movie's a fair bit holding it back. It's not all that funny. The pacing kind of stalls in a few areas. The final battle is kind of lame. I mean, good God, Ernesto. Just tear up the photo. Why did you keep it in your pocket? I don't get you. <laughs> Instead of all of this, Coco is astoundingly great it's such a rich power i don't story get that really you embraces the culture it portrays in ways that plain old disney movies rarely do additionally it has endearing characters a breathtaking world strong themes an actual good twist villain and just this sense of warmth that very few movies can fully capture coco just sucks me in every time i rewatch it i'm so in awe of everything it manages to accomplish in such a short amount of time and on top of all of its other strengths the emotional climax and the actual ending are straight up the the best out of any Pixar movie. It can't be overstated how flawlessly this movie comes to a close. It's just absolutely remarkable. I've talked about Coco many times before. I just love it. it I cried like a bitch at that ending. I, I'm not afraid to admit that. It's truly epic. But not quite as epic as Boss Baby! I'm sorry. I can now officially confirm that Boss Baby deserved the Oscar in 2017. But the Academy could rectify their mistake by giving the 2021 Oscar for Best Picture to the Boss Baby 2 Family Business. I will not sleep until this injustice is corrected. Three, 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 two, two. Wally. Got a blast. Every time I rewatch Wally, I am just in awe of it. What a bold, stunning idea for a feature film. What a tremendous first act. What a fun space adventure. What an excellent environmental message. What a breathtaking love story. What a phenomenal movie. Damn it, that stupid wheel pisses me off. Otto is a passable mm. twist villain and a pretty good obstacle for the heroes to overcome, but Damn it. for a movie with such <laughs> complex and layered robots protagonists, Robot they really drop the ball with the wheel. I feel like this movie begs for a villain with a counter ideology to the idea that Earth is sustainable. The humans from 700 years ago believed the Earth was beyond saving. The captain points out that the plant is living proof they were wrong. What is Otto's rebuttal to that? Irrelevant, Captain. What? <laughs> oh, okay, he doesn't really have a rebuttal. He's just boringly following his program. Okay. Damn it, why can't he have an interesting motivation? Why can't he formulate his own opinion about Earth or humanity? Tell the captain why he thinks they're beyond salvaging. Illustrate what makes him his own character rather than just a boring computer that does what he's told. Rogue AIs that independently think for themselves make for such interesting villains. And when literally every other robot in this story has their own personality, personality and motivations hmm. independent of what they were programmed for why <laughs> did you stop with the fucking villain sorry i'm really digging deep into this point because it is legitimately the only thing wrong with wally an amazing villain would have shot this movie into the top three honestly but this spot is nothing to sneeze at wally is a masterpiece and i totally understand why a ton of people rank it as the best pixar movie it's arguably their most audacious film to date shining a light on the slow decay of our planet and the plague of mega corporations monopolizing every aspect of our lives. I'm shocked that real life by and large was okay with Pixar making this film. But above all <laughs> else, Wally is a profound commentary on the nature of true love as portrayed by nearly voiceless machines. And it miraculously <laughs> works. 
No, it doesn't just work, it soars. This is an absolutely magnificent piece of art that everyone should experience at some point. God, just go watch Wally fam. You won't regret it. Like I said earlier, Toy Story 3 is kind of the perfect series finale for Pixar. I'm glad the studio kept going, if only because of Coco, Inside Out, and Toy Story 4. But regardless, <laughs> this would have been an excellent place to stop. Andy represents all of us growing up and driving away from the studio and the franchise that gave us so many fun times and emotional moments. But the thing is, this isn't the Pixar series finale, and it isn't even the Toy Story series finale anymore either. As I've said before, most people tend to judge this film exclusively on the power of its conclusion. But if you strip the movie of its conclusive weight by making another Toy Story movie, what exactly does this movie have? Simple. Hilarious new characters, intense yeah. drama, a perfect continuation of two's themes and narratives, and an expertly constructed, wildly creative prison break. Oh, that I love the prison, prison break, break is so, so good. So it's so, so awesome. This movie just does it for me. But on top of that, there's very little actually wrong with this movie. The only big problem for me is how the toys don't believe Woody when he claims they were being put in the attic, but even then, I can understand how they would assume the worst after Andy called them junk. It's kind of justified, but still a little weird they don't trust Woody after all these years. Aside from that, this movie is simply phenomenal. I love how the toys all get a chance to shine as a group. I think the jokes are really strong. I dig the darker tone so much, and I think Lotso makes for one of the best villains in any animated movie. It's a film I just never get tired of, and I think it works just as well as a penultimate installment in the series as it does a series finale. Hell, in terms of Woody's arc, I think it actually works better as the penultimate installment, like mm. I said earlier. It's amazing, you know it's amazing, it's Toy Story 3, baby. It doesn't get better than this. Except when it did before, but we'll get to that. Thank you. Yay! Oh, I'm glad this one got so high. I've somehow gone this long on this channel without ever diving into Monsters, Inc. And why I absolutely adore it. It's so it's really good! It all. It's arguably the funniest Pixar movie ever made, giving us tons of great physical comedy moments <laughs> and hilarious running jokes. It has some of the most iconic characters Pixar has ever made, from the main cast to the side peeps. If you showed me this picture, I would immediately recognize him as the 2319 guy. Yeah. This movie's characters and running gags are burned into my brain because they're so great. <laughs> and the dynamic between the main characters is even better. It's cool to get a movie for once where we don't have to focus on an unlikely duo learning to become friends. We could just start things off with their great dynamic and focus on the plot and world building instead. Mike and Sully are one of the best Pixar duos ever, and I appreciate the fact Thank that you. their friendship gets tested in a believable way. Every kid's movie seems to indulge themselves in that whole main character split up before coming back together in the climax shtick, but Monsters Inc. is one of those movies where it feels earned. The scene where they split up really chokes me up to this day, and honestly, thinking back, this might have been the first time in my life when a movie ever made me feel sad. I must have been three or four at the time, but I can vaguely remember watching this scene and getting emotionally invested in something for the first time in my life. It's crazy to think about that. Power anyway, Pixar. speaking of usually overdone tropes that the movie earns, Waternoose is such a fantastic twist villain. Randall is intimidating and fun enough, but when you add on a second villain whose motivations line up and parallel real world corrupt CEOs, that's some good shit. And the relationship between Sully and Boo is just the most wholesome oh, thing in the so movie. Oh, it's so good. I love it's it. It's just perfectly paced. He grows to like her at the perfect time. He gives her a nickname at the perfect time. Their interactions are just so beautiful, and I wouldn't change a thing about them. Truth be told, I could go on for days about how great Monsters, Inc. is. Everything comes together, from the humor, <laughs> to the world building, to the villains, to the score, to the climax, to that powerhouse of a final scene. Oh. If I had any complaints, it would probably be a bit of messiness with the story towards the middle, but otherwise, I can't get enough of this one. It should have beat Shrek for the first animated feature Oscar ever, but considering how many Oscars Pixar has now compared yeah. to DreamWorks, I think it's okay to let this one slide. <laughs> That's fun. Now this is what I'm talking about. Toy Story 2 is a masterpiece and a Schmose. huge improvement over the original in nearly every way. It's like a tiny bit less funny than the first movie, and let me emphasize that, a tiny bit. <laughs> this movie is still an absolute comedic riot. It made me laugh again and again. It's so smart and <laughs> that facial expression and fun and as close to perfection as Toy Story has ever gotten. 
As I've said before, this is the Toy Story that feels the most like an indie film, specifically with the Woody stuff. It's very introspective and compelling, and there are some parts where I start to think he might actually be better off at the museum. It's genuinely fantastic stuff, and it sets the stage perfectly for the rest of the films in the franchise to expand on this one's themes. Because Toy Story 2 is such a thematically rich film. It's a story about abandonment, grief, legacy, found family versus blood family, and so much more. It deals with such heavy content Concepts while managing to remain entirely lighthearted and fun throughout. The Buzz storyline is a hysterical romp with some of the first movie's most iconic side characters. The Woody storyline is a powerful, deconstructive look at what it means to be a toy, and whether it's worth subjecting yourself to all the wear and tear and eventual heartbreak once your kid grows up. Ultimately, it's beautiful to see Woody decide that it's worth it to stick by Andy and give Jesse another chance to be loved by a kid again. They know it'll all end one day, but at least they'll have each other for infinity and beyond. Even when they're miles apart, living out different lives and doing different things, they'll always have each other. I'm not even sure what else there is to say. Toy Story 2 is just one of the best sequels ever made. It expands the Toy Story universe so thoroughly and tells us way more about Woody and Buzz. It continues the story in a bold new direction. It introduces incredible new themes that build off of the original movie's foundation perfectly, and it leaves a huge impact on the remainder of the franchise. It's probably the best animated sequel of all time. I don't know if it's my favorite though. Don't make me choose. Yeah. It's absolutely <laughs> insane to think about that's, how many That's too hard. <laughs> this film turned out when you take its insanely troubled production history into account. Like, the fact that the film turned out this incredible, given its insane time constraints, is one of the biggest success stories in the history of film. It's the Majora's Mask of animated movies. Honestly. It's a near-perfect masterpiece in the pinnacle of the most iconic and acclaimed animated franchise ever. But there's still two movies that are even better. Okay, it's the Battle of Brad Bird. Ratatouille vs. The Incredibles. We had the exact same conversation for our Pixar Panic tournament. Let's see which one Skate for Less enjoys more. Here we go. And if you've watched a certain ranking video or a certain one hour analysis, you know exactly what those movies are. Oh, shit! No! Yes! It's Ratatouille! I've never really talked about it before, but I really like Ratatouille. That was a joke, actually. I have talked about it for a long time before. Hmm. Yeah, there's not a whole lot I can really I say should know. about Pixar's magnum opus that I haven't already covered recently. It is just leaps and bounds ahead of most of the studio's output. It almost feels too sophisticated for them, which is crazy since their movies are already really smart and clever and witty and mature and emotional. But this one just cranks all of those attributes up to 12. It is a tour de force in the realm of animation. But again, I have an hour-long video about this film that you can check out at your leisure. No, Let's no need to, to prolong the inevitable. Literally, what more could you possibly want out of a movie? The Incredibles is as close to perfection as Pixar has ever gotten. I genuinely can't think of a single thing wrong with this movie outside of its dated animation on the background humans. Like, <laughs> yikes, bruh. Otherwise, this is Pixar and Brad Bird at the top of their game, delivering a shockingly mature and adult script with a hefty dose of subtext to pick up on. From the domestic turmoil to the critique of insurance company practices to the unflinching amount of death that gets the dramatic weight it deserves, The Incredibles does not let up with its explicitly adult themes and story. It provides a bleak yet ultimately captivating look at a man trapped in a state of perpetual mediocrity, longing to break free and recapture the glory and acclaim of his youth until he finally learns to live in the present and appreciate his amazing, supportive family. Oh, and they're all superheroes. Yeah. That's just the icing on the deepest, richest, most delicious cake you'll ever eat and Pixar will ever bake. Yeah, that big the superheroes is just icing. Forms from a compelling, committed character drama in its first act to a gripping superhero adventure in its second and third is simply mind-blowing. Like, it's not enough that this animated movie released by Disney is a legit amazing character drama, but it also happens to be the best superhero movie ever. Don't debate me on that, you know it's true. The Incredibles is the absolute gold standard for the medium of animation, and while I think Ratatouille pushed its artistic boundaries a little further and deserves the title of Pixar's magnum opus, The Incredibles is nonetheless my pick for Pixar's best 
film. I don't know. I don't know how Brad Bird does it, but but there's no adult-oriented Pixar films before he joins the studio, and after he joins, there's two. Coincidence? I think not! <laughs> Also, isn't it wild that this is kind of a spy movie and Cars 2 is attempting to be that? It's interesting. Like, huh. you can only make the worst spy movie of all time. Or, or the, the best, best spy movie of all time. time. There's literally no in-between whatsoever. Huh. Weird. Yay! Uh... Well, well done, Skafrillis. Claps, claps indeed. That was beautiful, Be beautifully done. I'm glad that he was able to, you know, bring, shed some light on Pixar films that are, that I really do think get too much hate. Like, Fighting Dory, Toy Story 4, th those are really good movies, and people just don't really seem to appreciate what they have all the time. And Monsters U, yeah, it's, the, the stuff in it that's good is, like, really good. I just, w I just wish it was a more consistent movie. And, I, I I agree with this list a lot for the most part. I, I can't think of any glaring disagreements I have like I did with the the DreamWorks one. But uh, you know I I didn't react to that, so yeah, sorry. And uh, and uh, yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to discussing with my friends uh, how closely it aligns with our our own tournament which by the way i will leave a link in the description for the channel so that you can check out all of our podcasts they are all recorded and there for your viewing pleasure i highly re recommend checking them out and so with all that being said thank you all so much for joining me i hope you all liked the video as much as i did sorry again i didn't react to the dreamworks one my bad and stay tuned for the next video. Take care.